so we we did the survey through uh, Ezra, I believe, right? We did through Ezra. So we're to Nehemiah now. So you can open up your Bibles to, to the book of Nehemiah. And let me quickly assign a few people some scriptures to read. So uh, uh, Dr. Hahn, could you read Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18 when we get there? And um, Andrew, could you read Nehemiah 2, uh, 19 and 20? And Isaiah, uh, Nehemiah 4, verses 4 and 5. And uh, Raul, uh, Nehemiah 4, 1 to 3. Eugene, Nehemiah chapter 8. You there, Eugene? Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 6 and 8. And then Liz, could you read uh, Esther, if, if we get there, to uh, Esther chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. Maybe we'll get there. I'm just going to, we, ha we have to uh, survey these books. So good to see everyone here this evening. And the book of Nehemiah. So whereas Ezra was a religious leader nehemiah is a political leader right where ezra was a priest what's nehemiah's position in the government he becomes the governor so ezra is a priest nehemiah is the governor and ezra is about the restoration rebuilding of the temple the temple Nehemiah is about the re reconstruction of the walls, the walls. So one is more religious, one is more civil, if you will. And remember, we're dealing with a theocracy. So this is a nation, a government in which God is, well, it's really a monarchy, it had been a monarchy, but uh, there's really no king right now. So so the rebuilding of the wall is is of of great importance living in the city i think we should love these books because they're both urban books one you could say is i mean if you want to make an application to us it's church planting in the city that's ezra <laughs> he's building the temple in the city of jerusalem and nehemiah he's rebuilding the broken culture and you think about our culture, it's it's smashed to smithereens and it's becoming more smashed. So we we have a lot of rebuilding to do. We need to be Nehemiahs without a doubt in our in our land, in our cities, in our church, in our own churches. So. In your book. If, if you want to turn, we're going to actually just read one little section here as well. And Maureen, could you read this? Uh, Maureen Lopez? What, what page, Pastor? Yeah, I'm going to tell you the page. On page, if we go to page 167, and this is just going to kind of review what I just said, but just I just wanted to reinforce repetition is the mother of learning so on page 167 down on that page where it says what is nehemiah about you see that about two-thirds of the way down the page yes read that paragraph please maureen thank you what is nehemiah about ursa relates the restoration of the nation's temple and nehemiah's records the reconstruction of the nation's capital city Together, they provide an account of the religious and political activities of the remnant, which had recently returned from the Babylonian captivity. Okay, thank you, uh, Maureen. So these are exciting books. I, I, I find these books to be very exciting. Now, another thing about Nehemiah you might want to jot down, there's not a blank, but you might want to make a note of this, is that Nehemiah takes place around the time of what prophet we mentioned that actually back on that chart on page 18 
what prophet is contemporary to Nehemiah? Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. When Israel went back into the land, Ezra rebuilt the temple and seeks to bring the people back to the law. Even in Nehemiah, they're reading the word of God. They're going back to the law. They're being revived. But yet already, shortly after this, by the end of Nehemiah, in fact, it seems, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 6, that's around the time of Malachi, the end of Nehemiah, that the failure, the failures of the people that angered Nehemiah inspired the message of Malachi. The failures of the people that angered Nehemiah inspire the message of Malachi. And when I say the anger of Nehemiah, remember, look at his anger. And, and it's a righteous anger in Nehemiah chapter 13. Uh, could I ask you to read that, please, Lorraine? Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 25. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25. Yep. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Okay, and that's what that's one of the things going on in the book of Malachi for sure. And if you look in verse six, let me read Nehemiah 13, verse six. If you back up there, it says, But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I to the king, and after certain days I obtained leave of the king. So many people believe when Nehemiah had left, went back to to uh, Artaxerxes in Babylon, that's when the people, you know, like you had just mentioned during the, the judges, when the judge died, the people started to sin. Well, Nehemiah didn't die, but he left. And when the leaders stray, the people play, as the saying goes. So that's around the time that Nehemiah was written. And some people also make this parallel in that, whereas Ezra is, the, is a scribe, and in the days of Jesus, remember the scribes? Generally, they had become very corrupt and hateful to the Lord. Some say that, and this isn't exactly a perfect parallel, but some say that Nehemiah is, in a sense, the first of the Pharisees. Because look at that verse you just read. He's very straight, very cut and dry. And the Pharisees were very legalistic, hyper, hyper legalistic, whereas Nehemiah had a heart in what he was doing and a sincerity. The Pharisees had become very insincere, but were also very legalistic and very strict in their legalism and their tradition, not based on the Bible, but on, on man's tradition. But, but it shows what I'm saying, I guess, is how what started pure and sincere in these days with Ezra some the first scribe nehemiah almost like yeah a strict believer but a man of god how it became very corrupt by the days of jesus so we have to keep walking with the lord we have to we need to have a heart for 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 god we can't mm -hmm. remove our heart from serving the lord and just make it about rules and strict regulations and we have to have to be careful not to be not to establish human traditions as the essence of our spirituality. And it's easy to do. You, it's easy to do. Sometimes you don't even realize you're doing it and you do it. Okay. So Nehemiah, his name means what? According to your notes, his name means comfort. Now, the, the purpose of Nehemiah is Nehemiah shows how the broken walls, there's the blank there under the purpose, the broken walls of Jerusalem and the broken faith of the Jewish people was restored and built. Now, Nehemiah was written around 420 B.C.,
around the during during his life and the um and we're saying that Nehemiah is the author of this book as well. The author of this book, and that, that's at the top, the author is Nehemiah. Now, that's different from what our book says. The author of our, of our survey book, Geisler, says that Ezra is the author of Nehemiah. And so there is some difference of opinion about that. But the reason I'm going to say that it was it's Nehemiah is all of the personal pronouns that he uses in this book. So let's just go to Nehemiah chapter one and the very first verse. And it even says in the first verse, the words of Nehemiah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. And as you read this, it's filled with personal pronouns. It's, he says, I, when he's talking about himself and we'll see other verses, we won't read them now but I'll point it out when we do. We'll see other verses when he's talking to the group. It's we and us. So he's using personal pronouns of the first person. So you can keep that in mind as you read the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is a book of leadership. And that's, I, I believe that should all draw us to Nehemiah because we want to be leaders for Jesus Christ. If you want to study leadership, study the book of Nehemiah. It is a powerful book of leadership. So let's read a few verses about this. And so, uh, Dr. Hahn, I can mute myself here. Could you read Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 17 and 18? And again, notice the personal pronouns here, the us and the we of Nehemiah chapter 2, 17 and 18. Okay. Okay, you can read. Okay. Um Chapter 2, verses 17 to 18 says, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no more, that we may be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Okay, so let's just stop. Uh, let's just stop there for a moment. And, and let me ask you a question. In those two verses, what are some lessons of leadership that Nehemiah demonstrates? What are, how does Nehemiah demonstrate excellent leadership here? Remember, he's an outsider. He's coming into a city. That has been broken down now for a hundred years. This is, I mean, the walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed in 586. This is actually about 150 years later. The walls are still broken down. So how does he exercise leadership? Who would like to respond to that question? He says, let us. I'm use sorry, let's, okay. He says, let us. Okay. Yeah. He doesn't just say, you guys get to this work. He said, so he, he includes himself, right? In, in the work that needs to be done. Very good. What's another good uh, example of his leadership? Okay. He gets them to focus on the legitimate need and the need of their city, the need of Jerusalem, the city of God, this is an important city for, for the people of God because of the kingdom of God that's going to come there one day. And so, yeah, so it was the city, it was to build the city of Jerusalem. Okay, what's another? What's another? Yes, Esther? yeah okay so esther said how nehemiah says the hand of god is upon me and that's right a leader and what will that do to the people when he said god's hand has led me here now remember too nehemiah has come chapter one is about prayer we skipped over things chapter two he's brought home depot into the city when i say home depot the king has given him all this wood 
and building materials. It's like Home Depot. I call it Home Depot on wheels. <laughs> and so, and and he surveyed the ruins himself. He sees the need. And then, and he says, God's hand is on me to do this. That inspires what? The confidence of the people. Okay. Yeah. yeah there's, well, who else would like to add to that? Somebody else is going to say something. I was saying that he also inspired their trust in him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To to have confidence and trust and trust in him. Yeah. And and then Nehemiah, as Liz first said, and he uses these personal pronouns. He doesn't he doesn't berate them. He doesn't say, "Why have you been here for 150 years? You lazy, good for nothings." <laughs> You know, you should have been building this wall. Why, why did it take you? You know, he, he, that would be very bad leadership. It would be very negative. He's very positive. And he's saying, God's hand is with me now. Let us do it. And Nehemiah is putting himself together with them. So I, I think those verses are very powerful. Now, Andrew, could you read verses 19 and 20? And these verses are also about leadership of Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse 19 and 20. Yes, but when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arab, the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then, I, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Okay, now, so I asked the same question for these verses. How does Nehemiah, in these verses, exercise very wise and strong leadership? What do you think? How does he exercise strong leadership here in these verses? He makes himself one of them. Okay. Yes, Esther. Very good. Uh, thank you, Joan. That's good. And Esther? Yeah. Okay. That if, if good is going to happen, God is going to do it. That's what Esther said. The Lord is going to be the one. So he, he puts, so a good leader gets people to, to focus on the greatness of God. If God is with us, the hand of God is with Nehemiah, and he's giving them that confidence. And yes, Esther, Dr. Hahn. Okay. Yeah, that's a big thing. Now, this is a big thing in the book of Nehemiah. These enemies, they're actually first mentioned in verse 10, where it grieved these men that Nehemiah was there to rebuild the city. It grieved them, and now they're mocking. So good leaders have to recognize what? Is everything going to be easy? Are no. you going to have people against you? Yeah. Okay. Or should, will they stop you, though? That's right. That's leadership. So leadership recognizes there's going to be hardship and enemies against us, but God is greater. And as we've been looking in our radio program, if God be for us, who can be against us? It, mm -hmm. And the answer isn't no one. The answer is it doesn't matter. See, there are people against Nehemiah, but God is with him. And God and Nehemiah make the majority. So, so it's great leadership. Anyone else want to make a comment about that? About the leadership of Nehemiah? That we could we could actually write a book on those verses, I, I believe. But anyone else want to make a comment? Raul, what do you think about those verses? I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Well, I like the point that was brought up about like the attribution to God. If anything good is going to, you know, come, it's going to come from God. I was thinking about um, we we studied that in the last uh, the last two radio programs on Romans. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that is important because you have to you you have to look to God for the ultimate solution in everything. And I think that leaders, um, you know, oftentimes have been very effective and then proven to kind of go downhill is because you can take the focus off God and see the track record of blessing 
in being led by the Lord in being immersed in the scriptures and then thinking, wow, you know, I'm pretty clever. I, I, I have it all together to the point. You know what I mean? That I, I can do this on my own now. Um, I've gained a following. You know what I mean? I, I, I have some popularity now. Um, not that I'm a leader, but that's just something I think that that everybody has to be cautious with. Very good. That's that's true. Because actually, Nehemiah had the support of the king in this building project. As I say, he he gave him many materials. He gave him materials, and and he even gave him safe passage and protection to move those materials so they wouldn't get stolen in that long journey. But Nehemiah's trust was not in the materials, wasn't in the king. It was in the Lord, the God of heaven, he'll prosper. So it's a great book of leadership. It's a great book about prayer. That's letter B. Revival. And I'm adding a letter here that's not in your notes. D. Dealing with enemies. Now, if you want to be challenged in the book of Nehemiah, study these enemies that begin in chapter 2, verse 10, and trace them through the book. Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arabian. There are three. Sometimes they're mentioned, two are mentioned, sometimes all three are mentioned. But what's interesting is that these men were dead set against Nehemiah. But other people in Israel were buddying up to them and, and compromising with them. And working against Nehemiah while they were befriending some of the leaders in high places. So it created a disruption in the work. But Nehemiah is focused. He doesn't allow them to distract him from the work. And it's very interesting. It's I love the study of those enemies. So these enemies are uh, referenced in chapter 4. I've asked Isaiah... If you could read Isaiah chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 here as well, we see them once again in, in Nehemiah. Uh, and let, let, me just, let me just say this um, first, though. In verses 1 and 2 here of chapter 4, it says they, they, they mock the Jews, it says. They take indignation, and then they're, they're even mocking the work. They're like saying, you think you're going to build these this wall up in a day and what a joke you guys uh, and then they even mock them a fox can walk over that wall and it'll fall down you know so they're really mocking them but what does nehemiah do to combat these enemies and that's the point here it's really letter b look at this it's letter b this is a book of prayer a leader is a man of prayer and when you have enemies you have to pray Look at all the prayers. Sometimes his prayers are long, first chapter. Sometimes his prayers, he, he even prays before the king. The king says, why are you sad? You're not supposed to be sad before me. Don't you know I could have you killed if you're sad before me? And right there before the king, Nehemiah shot up a prayer to God. I mean, he didn't get on his knees or anything. It was just from his heart. You know, so like you could pray anywhere. So, so all different kinds of prayers. So Isaiah, could you read chapter four? Verses 4 and 5, here's Nehemiah's prayer. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. What do you think of that prayer? Is there mercy in it? <laughs> What does he want to have happen to those guys? Was he right to pray such a prayer? Chapter 4. But it came to pass that when Sam Ballot heard that we Who's built that? the... Who's doing that? And to... Who's doing that to us? <laughs> it's a mistake. <laughs> oh, was that you, Joan? Yes. Okay. That is doing on you. <laughs> that's all right that's okay well Sorry. you know what these, these men wanted to destroy nehemiah they wanted to destroy the work of god this is in the old testament this is called an, an uh an imprecatory prayer where you're praying down judgment upon someone and we have to be very careful i'm not you know as new testament believers we want to pray down mercy on people but 
we, we often see this in the book of Psalms and we see it in the book of Nehemiah. Okay, it's a book of prayer. It's a book of revival in chapter eight. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, you know what, Raul, you were supposed to read those verses. I I got back. I got backwards here. Okay, but uh, Raul, why don't you read this? So re go to chapter six. And Raul, could you read chapter six and verses one through three? I love this section too. Nehemiah so, chapter six, verses one through three. This is about the enemies. Now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the, and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to me mischief. And I sent messages, messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Whistle I, whistle I leave it and come down to you. Okay. So they try to distract him. In this chapter, they accuse him. You just want to be the king. They, they slander him. You just want to be the king over the people. Then they, they try to get him so afraid to go and hide in the temple. And he's not supposed to hide in the temple. He's not supposed to have access to the temple. So they were trying to get him to diso. So they tried to get him a number of ways. But Nehemiah was very wise dealing with his enemies. That's a great study in the book of Nehemiah. Okay, book of revival. So Eugene, could you read chapter 8, verse 6 and 8? Eugene, are you there? Okay. Uh, Sister Barani, are you there? Could you read? Yes. Okay, great. How are you tonight, Barani? Great. Good, good. So in Nehemiah chapter 8, there's a phrase. The phrase is, bring the book. They want the word of God read. And this is a revival at Watergate. Isn't that an interesting place for a revival? Because water speaks of refreshing. So they're going to bring the refreshing streams of God's word at the water gate here. And that's what it says in verse 1. The people were gathered together. And they say to Ezra, bring the book. So could you please read, Barani, verses 5 and 6 of, Ezra, or of Nehemiah chapter 8? And Ezra is referenced here. So remember, Ezra and Nehemiah are now, they're working together. Nehemiah 8, chapter 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, 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 with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Amen. You know, whenever, <laughs> thank you. When Whenever we have the Lord's Supper, I, I say, raise your hands to the heaven and bow your heads to the earth. I get it from that verse right there. It's Bible. That's Bible right there. Raise your hands. Say amen. Amen. So, you know, they're worshiping. They're raising their hands. They're praising God. Their, their, head, their heads are bowed. And now, Barani, could you also read verse 8? And this is a great verse about expositional preaching, expository preaching in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctively, oh, distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Okay. So they read the book, they explain the book, and they apply the book. Basically, according to that verse, they gave the sense there's explanation, but then there's application where it says they caused them to understand. They applied it to their own situation. And this chapter has one of the great texts of scripture. I know you know this one. I'm going to start it. You finish it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah, do you know where it is? Sometimes we know those verses. 
but we have no idea where it is. It's in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. There it is. Underline it. And remember that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So they build booths, they reenact, they, they reinstitute the Feast of, of, of Tabernacles, which they had not done for many years. And there was great gladness when you obey the Lord, there's joy, there's joy. So it's a book of leadership, a book of prayer, a book of revival, a book of dealing with our enemies. And we're saying the key verse of Nehemiah is the verse we read earlier, chapter 2, verse number 17, where he says, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And so that's the key verse of Nehemiah. You need to know that. And then the last couple of blanks here, just the general outline, a very general outline. The work is number one. The wall is the theme. And in this, this opening section, we see Nehemiah's prayer, his plan the construction, and then the conflict. And then we see worship. The law is the theme. There's that revival. There's the rededication. And then there's the reform. And, you know, I mentioned, I'll just close with this. I mentioned, we, we talked about Nehemiah's enemies. Look in chapter 13. And... Look at verses seven and eight. Now, so the, the enemies were Sam Ballad and Tobiah. They were the two main enemies. And they were dead set. They had mocked Nehemiah. They tried to, they, they did slander Nehemiah. They distracted him. They tried to put him in fear. And, and yet they were trying to compromise with the people of the land to infiltrate. They're trying to infiltrate the work of God. That's that's what the devil, this is what the devil wants to do to destroy the work of God, by the way, is infiltrate the work of God. And Nehemiah is very perceptive of that. So when he left to Babylon and got back to Jerusalem, look what he finds in Jerusalem. Verse 7 and 8. Uh, Eugene, do you have those verses? Could you read the last few verses? Are you in the book of Nehemiah? Do you have it open? Uh, which book, Pastor? I'm sorry. Oh, you, Nehemiah. Okay. Nehemiah. Yeah, Nehemiah chapter 13. Okay, Nehemiah. Okay, hold on just one second. Do, 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 do. And read verse seven and eight, and then we'll be we'll be done. Okay. Look what Come happens on. when he comes to Jerusalem. Look who's living in the storehouses of the temple. Uh, Nehemiah chapter eight, chapter thirteen. Oh, I'm sorry, chapter thirteen. Okay, hold on. Verse seven and eight. Okay. Just give me one second. I'll find it. Sorry about that. Seven and eight. Okay. Uh, yeah, so seven and eight. Wait, this is correct. Hold on, chapter 13, seven yeah. and eight. And I came to Jerusalem. Oh, I see. Okay, that was correct. Okay, and came back to and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned uh, about the evil thing uh, Elijah Elisha had done in providing Tobin a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobias' uh, household goods out of the room. Okay, so while Nehemiah was gone, he infiltrated the temple and was had a special room in the temple that this leader named Eliashib, who was one of the Jewish rulers who was who was working, and, and this is this is how the enemy works. He was trying to get in on the inside. And when Nehemiah came in, he he threw out his socks. He like threw out it, get it, get your clothes out of here, man. He's throwing out his his suits, his socks. Get you're not living in the house of God, you know. So Nehemiah, he, he took a stand and he could and, and it says it says in verse 11, 
I contended with the rulers. I contended with them and he challenged them. So Nehemiah is a great leader. And so uh, we'll, we'll stop right there and we'll take a break. And I hope you enjoy reading the book of Nehemiah the next time you read it and study it. It's a great book from God's word.